Hercule Poirot stood upon the landing for a moment. His head was a little on one side with a listening air. He could hear nothing from downstairs. He crossed to the landing window and looked out. Mary Rastarik was below on the terrace, resuming her gardening work. Poirot nodded his head in satisfaction. He walked gently along the corridor. One by one, in turn, he opened the doors. A bathroom, a linen cupboard, a double-bedded spare room, an occupied single bedroom, a woman's room with a double bed. Mary Ristarics? The next door was that of an adjoining room, and was, he guessed, the room belonging to Andrew Ristarik. He turned to the other side of the landing. The door he opened first was a single bedroom. It was not, he judged, occupied at the time, but it was a room which possibly was occupied at weekends. There were toilet brushes on the dressing table. He listened carefully, then tiptoed in. He opened the wardrobe. Yes, there were some clothes hanging up there. Country clothes. There was a writing table, but there was nothing on it. He opened the desk drawers very softly. There were a few odds and ends, a letter or two, but the letters were trivial and dated some time ago. He shut the desk drawers. He walked downstairs, and going out of the house, bade farewell to his hostess. He refused her offer of tea. He had promised to get back, he said, as he had to catch a train to town very shortly afterwards. Do you want a taxi? We could order you one, or I could drive you in the car. No, no, madame, you are too kind. Poirot walked back to the village and turned down the lane by the church. He crossed a little bridge over a stream. Presently he came to where a large car with a chauffeur was waiting discreetly under a beech tree. The chauffeur opened the door of the car. Poirot got inside, sat down, and removed his patent leather shoes, uttering a gasp of relief. "'Now we return to London,' he said. The chauffeur closed the door, returned to his seat, and the car purred quietly away. The sight of a young man standing by the roadside furiously thumbing a ride was not an unusual one. Poirot's eyes rested almost indifferently on this member of the fraternity, a brightly dressed young man with long and exotic hair. There were many such, but in the moment of passing him, Poirot suddenly sat upright and addressed the driver. "'If you please, stop. Yes, and if you can reverse a little? There is someone requesting a lift.' The chauffeur turned an incredulous eye over his shoulder. It was the last remark he would have expected. However, Poirot was gently nodding his head, so he obeyed. The young man called David advanced to the door. "'Thought you weren't going to stop for me,' he said cheerfully. Much obliged, I'm sure. He got in, removed a small pack from his shoulders, and let it slide to the floor, smoothed down his copper-brown locks. So, you recognize me, he said. You are perhaps somewhat conspicuously dressed. Oh, do you think so? <laughs> Not really. I'm just one of a band of brothers. The school of Van Dyck. Very dressy. Oh, <laughs> I've never thought of it like that. Yes. There may be something in what you say. You should wear a cavalier's hat, said Poirot, and a lace collar, if I might advise. Oh, I don't think we go quite as far as that, the young man laughed. How Mrs. Rastarik dislikes the mere sight of me. Actually, I reciprocate her dislike. I don't care much for Rastarik either. There is something singularly unattractive about successful tycoons, don't you think? It depends on your point of view. You have been paying attentions to the daughter, I understand. <laughs> that is such a nice phrase, said David. Paying attentions to the daughter. I suppose it might be called that, but there's plenty of fifty-fifty about it, you know. She's paying attention to me, too. Where is Mademoiselle now? David turned his head rather sharply. And why do you ask that? I should like to meet her. He shrugged his shoulders. I don't believe she'd be your type, you know. Any more than I am. Norma's in London. But you said to her stepmother, Oh, we don't tell stepmothers everything. And where is she in London? She works in an interior decorator's down the King's Road, somewhere in Chelsea. Can't remember the name of it for the moment. Susan Phelps, I think. But that is not where she lives, I presume. You have her address? Ah, oh, yes, a great block of flats. I don't really understand your interest. One is interested in so many things. What do you mean? What brought you to that house? What is its name? Cross Hedges, today. Brought you secretly into the house and up the stairs. 
I came in the back door, I admit. What were you looking for upstairs? Uh, that's my business. Look, I don't want to be rude, but aren't you being rather nosy? Yes, uh, I am displaying curiosity. I would like to know exactly where this young lady is. I see. Dear Andrew and dear Mary, Lord Rotham, are employing you, is that it? They're trying to find her. As yet, said Poirot, I do not think they know that she is missing. Well, someone must be employing you. You are exceedingly perceptive, said Poirot. He leant back. I wondered what you were up to, said David. That's why I hailed you. I hoped you'd stop and give me a bit of dope. She's my girl. You know that, I suppose. I understand that that is supposed to be the idea, said Poirot cautiously. If so, you should know where she is. Is that not so, Mr.— I am sorry, I do not think I know your name beyond, that is, that your Christian name is David. Baker. Perhaps, Mr. Baker, you have had a quarrel. No, we haven't had a quarrel. Why should you think we had? Miss Norma Restaric left Cross Hedges on Sunday evening. Or was it Monday morning? Well, it depends. There is an early bus you can take. Gets you to London a little after ten. It would make her a bit late at work, but not too much. Usually she goes back on Sunday night. She left there Sunday night, but she has not arrived at Borodine Mansions. Apparently not, so Claudia says. This uh, Miss Rhys Holland, that is her name, is it not? Was she surprised or worried? <laughs> Good Lord, no. Why should she be? They don't keep tabs on each other all the time, these girls. But you thought she was going back there? Well, she didn't go back to work, either. They're fed up at the shop, I can tell you. Are you worried, Monsieur Baker? Well, no. Naturally. I mean... Well, I'm damned if I know. I, I don't see any reason I should be worried. Only time's getting on. What is it today? Thursday? She has not quarrelled with you? No. We don't quarrel. But you are worried about her, Mr. Baker. Well, what business is it of yours? It is no business of mine, but there has, I understand, been trouble at home. She does not like her stepmother. Quite right, too. She's a bitch, that woman. Hard as nails. She doesn't like Norma, either. Well, she has been ill, has she not? She had to go to hospital. Well, who are you talking about? Norma? No, I am not talking about Miss Restaric. I am talking about Mrs. Restaric. I believe she did go into a nursing home. No reason she should. Strong as a horse, I'd say. And Miss Restaric hates her stepmother? She's a bit unbalanced sometimes, Norma. You know, goes off the deep end. I tell you, girls always hate their stepmothers. Does that always make stepmothers ill? Ill enough to go to hospital? What the hell are you getting at? Gardening, perhaps. Or the use of weed killer. What do you mean by talking about weed killer? Are you suggesting that Norma... that she'd dream of... of that? People talk, said Poirot. Talk goes round the neighbourhood. Do you mean that somebody has said that Norma has tried to poison her stepmother? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. It is very unlikely, I agree, said Poirot. Actually, people have not been saying that. Oh, sorry, I, I misunderstood, but well, what did you mean? My dear young man, said Poirot. You must realize that there are rumors going about, and rumors are almost always about the same person. A husband. What? Poor old Andrew? Most unlikely, I should say. Yes, yes, it does not seem to me very likely. Well, <laughs> what were you there for, then? You are a detective, aren't you? Yes. Well, then? We are talking at cross-purposes, said Poirot. I did not go down there to inquire into any doubtful or possible case of poisoning. You must forgive me if I cannot answer your question. It is all very hush-hush. You understand? What on earth do you mean by that? I went there, said Poirot, to see Sir Roderick Horsfield. What, that old boy? He's practically gaga, isn't he? He is a man, said Poirot, who is in possession of a great many secrets. I do not mean that he takes an active part in such things nowadays, but he knows a good deal. He was connected with a great many things in the past war. He knew several people. Well, that's all over years ago, though. 
Yes, yes, his part in things is all over years ago, but do you not realize that there are certain things that it might be useful to know? What sort of things? Faces, said Poirot. A well-known face, perhaps, which Sir Roderick might recognize? A face or a mannerism, a, a way of talking, a way of walking, a gesture. People do remember, you know, old people. They remember not things that have happened last week or last month or last year, but they remember something that happened, say, nearly twenty years ago. And they may remember someone who does not want to be remembered. And they can tell you certain things about a certain man or a certain woman or something they were mixed up in. I am speaking very vaguely, you understand. I went to him for information. You went to him for information, did you? That old boy. Gaga. And he gave it to you? Let us say that I am quite satisfied. David continued to stare at him. I wonder now, he said, did you go to see the old boy, or did you go to see the little girl, eh? Huh? Did you want to know what she was doing in the house? I've wondered once or twice myself. Do you think she took that post there to get a bit of past information out of the old boy? I do not think— said Poirot, that it will serve any useful purpose to discuss these matters. She seems a very devoted and attentive, uh, what shall I call her, secretary? A mixture of hospital nurse, secretary, companion, au pair girl, and uncle's help. Yes, one could find a good many names for her, couldn't one? He's besotted about her. You noticed that? It is not unnatural under the circumstances, said Poirot primly. I can tell you someone who doesn't like her. And that's our Mary. And she perhaps does not like Mary Resteric either. So that's what you think, is it? said David. That Sonia doesn't like Mary Resteric. Perhaps you go as far as thinking that she may have made a few inquiries as to where the weed killer was kept. Pah, he added. The whole thing's ridiculous. All right. Thanks for the lift. I think I'll get out here. Aha, this is where you want to be. We are still a good seven miles out of London. I'll get out here. Goodbye, Monsieur Poirot. Goodbye. Poirot leant back in his seat as David slammed the door. Mrs. Oliver prowled round her sitting room. She was very restless. An hour ago she had parceled up a typescript that she had just finished correcting. She was about to send it off to her publisher, who was anxiously awaiting it and constantly prodding her about it every three or four days. There you are said Mrs. Oliver, addressing the empty air and conjuring up an imaginary publisher. There you are, and I hope you like it. I don't. I think it's lousy. I don't believe you know whether anything I write is good or bad. Anyway, I warned you. I told you it was frightful. You said, oh, no, no, I don't believe that for a moment. You just wait and see, said Mrs. Oliver vengefully. You just wait and see. She opened the door, called to Edith, her maid, gave her the parcel, and directed that it should be taken to the post at once. "'And now,' said Mrs. Oliver, "'what am I going to do with myself?' She began strolling about again. "'Yes,' thought Mrs. Oliver. "'I wish I had those tropical birds and things back on the wall, instead of these idiotic cherries. I used to feel like something in a tropical wood. A lion, or a tiger, or a leopard, or a cheetah. What could I possibly feel like in a cherry orchard, except a bird-scarer?' She looked round again. "'Cheeping like a bird, that's what I ought to be doing,' she said gloomily. "'Eating cherries. I wish it was the right time of year for cherries. I'd like some cherries. I wonder now.' She went to the telephone. "'I will ascertain, madam,' said the voice of George, in answer to her inquiry. Presently another voice spoke. "'Hercule Poirot at your service, madam,' he said. "'Where have you been?' said Mrs. Oliver. "'You've been away all day.' I suppose you went down to look out the hysterics. Is that it? Did you see Sir Roderick? What did you find out? Nothing, said Hercule Poirot. How dreadfully dull, said Mrs. Oliver. No, I do not think it is really so dull. It is rather astonishing that I have not found out anything. Well, why is it so astonishing? I don't understand. Because, said Poirot, it means either there was nothing to find out, and that, let me tell you, does not accord with the facts, or else something— was being very cleverly concealed. That, you see, would be interesting. Mrs. Restaric, by the way, did not know the girl was missing. You mean she has nothing to do with the girl having disappeared? So it seems. 
I met there the young man. You mean the unsatisfactory young man that nobody likes? That is right, the unsatisfactory young man. Did you think he was unsatisfactory? From whose point of view? Well, not from the girl's point of view, I suppose. The girl who came to see me, I am sure, would have been highly delighted with him. Did he look very awful? He looked very beautiful, said Hercule Poirot. Beautiful, said Mrs. Oliver. I don't know that I like beautiful young men. Girls do, said Poirot. Yes, you're quite right. They like beautiful young men. I don't mean good-looking young men, or smart-looking young men, or well-dressed or well-washed-looking young men. I mean they either like young men looking as though they were just going into a restoration comedy, or else very dirty young men looking as though they were just going to take some awful tramp's job. It seemed that he also did not know where the girl is now, or else he wasn't admitting it. Perhaps. He had gone down there. Why? He was actually in the house. He had taken the trouble to walk in without anyone seeing him. Again, why? For what reason? Was he looking for the girl, or was he looking for something else? You think he was looking for something? He was looking for something in the girl's room, said Poirot. Well, how do you know? Did you see him there? No, I only saw him coming down the stairs, but I found a very nice little piece of damp mud in Norma's room that could have come from his shoe. It is possible that she herself may have asked him to bring her something from that room. There are a lot of possibilities. There is another girl in that house, and a pretty one. He may have come down there to meet her. Yes, many possibilities. What are you going to do next? demanded Mrs. Oliver. Nothing, said Poirot. Well, that's very dull, said Mrs. Oliver disapprovingly. I am going to receive perhaps a little information from those I have employed to find it, though it is quite possible that I shall receive nothing at all. But aren't you going to do something? Not till the right moment, said Poirot. Well, I shall, said Mrs. Oliver. Pray, pray, be very careful, he implored her. What nonsense! What could happen to me? Where there is murder, anything can happen. I tell that to you. I, Poirot. Mr. Gobi sat in a chair. He was a small, shrunken little man, so nondescript as to be practically non-existent. He looked attentively at the claw foot of an antique table and addressed his remarks to it. He never addressed anybody direct. Glad you got the names for me, Mr. Poirot, he said. Otherwise, you know, it might have taken a lot of time. As it is, I've got the main facts and a bit of gossip on the side. Always useful, that. I'll begin at Borodine Mansion, shall I? Poirot inclined his head graciously. Plenty of porters, Mr. Gobi informed the clock on the chimney-piece. I started there, used one or two different young men. Expensive, but worth it. Didn't want it thought that there was anyone making any particular inquiries. Shall I use initials or names? Within these walls you can use the names, said Poirot. Miss Claudia Rees Holland, spoken of as a very nice young lady, father an MP, ambitious man, gets himself in the news a lot. She's his only daughter. She does secretarial work. Serious girl, no wild parties, no drink, no beatniks. Shares flat with two others. Number two works for the Wedderburn Gallery in Bond Street. Arty type. Whoops it up a bit with the Chelsea set, goes round to places arranging exhibitions and art shows. The third one is your one. Not been there long. General opinion is that she's a bit wanting. Not all there in the top story. But it's all a bit vague. One of the porters is a gossipy type. Buy him a drink or two and you'll be surprised at the things he'll tell you. Who drinks and who drugs and who's having trouble with his income tax and who keeps his cash behind the cistern? Of course you can't believe it all. Anyway, there was some story about a revolver being fired one night. A revolver fired? Was anyone injured? There seems a bit of doubt as to that. His story is he heard a shot fired one night and he comes out and there was this girl, your girl, standing there with a revolver in her hand. She looked sort of dazed. And then one of the other young ladies, or both of them, in fact, they come running along. And Miss Carey, that's the arty one, says, Norma, what on earth have you done? And Miss Rhys Holland, she says sharp-like, Shut up, can't you, Francis? Don't be a fool. And she took the revolver away from your girl and says, Give me that. She slams it into her handbag. Then she notices this chap, Mickey, 
and goes over to him and says, laughing like, That must have startled you, didn't it? And Mickey, he says it gave him quite a turn, and she says, You needn't worry, matter of fact, we'd no idea this thing was loaded. We were just fooling about. And then she says, Anyway, if anybody asks you questions, tell them it is quite all right. And then she says, Come on, Norma, and took her arm and led her along to the elevator, and they all went up again. But Mickey said he was a bit doubtful still. He went and had a good look round the courtyard. Mr. Gobi lowered his eyes and quoted from his notebook. I'll tell you, I found something I did. I found some wet patches, sure as anything I did. Drops of blood they were. I touched them with my finger. I tell you what I think. Somebody had been shot. Some man, as he was running away. I went upstairs, and I asked if I could speak to Miss Holland. I says to her, I think there may have been someone shot, Miss. I says, There are some drops of blood in the courtyard. Good gracious, she says. How ridiculous. I expect you know, she says. It must have been one of the pigeons. And then she says, I'm sorry if it gave you a turn. Forget about it. And she slipped me a five-pound note. Five-pound note, no less. Well, naturally, I didn't open my mouth after that. And then, after another whiskey, he comes out with some more. If you ask me, she took a pot shot at that low-class young chap that comes to see her. I think she had a row, and she did her best to shoot him. That's what I think. But least said, soonest mended. So I'm not repeating it. If anyone asks me anything, I'll say I don't know what they're talking about. Mr. Gerby paused. Interesting, said Poirot. Yes, but it's as likely as not that it's a pack of lies. Nobody else seems to know anything about it. There's a story about a gang of young thugs who came barging into the courtyard one night and had a bit of a fight, flick knives out and all that. I see, said Poirot. Another possible source of blood in the courtyard. Maybe the girl did have a row with her young man, threatened to shoot him, perhaps, and Mickey overheard it and mixed the whole thing up, especially if there was a car backfiring just then. Yes, said Hercule Poirot, and sighed. That would account for things quite well. Mr. Gobi turned over another leaf of his notebook and selected his confidant. He chose an electric radiator. Joshua Ristaric Limited, a family firm, been going over a hundred years. Well thought of in the city, always very sound, nothing spectacular, founded by Joshua Ristaric in 1850. Launched out after the First War with greatly increased investments abroad, mostly South Africa, West Africa, and Australia. Simon and Andrew Ristaric, the last of the Ristarics. Simon, the elder brother, died about a year ago, no children. His wife had died some years previously. Andrew Ristaric seems to have been a restless chap. His heart was never really in the business, though everyone says he had plenty of ability. Finally ran off with some woman, leaving his wife and a daughter of five years old. Went to South Africa, Kenya, and various other places. A no divorce. His wife died two years ago. Had been an invalid for some time. He travelled about a lot, and wherever he went he seems to have made money. Concessions for minerals, mostly. Everything he touched prospered. After his brother's death, he seems to have decided it was time to settle down. He'd married again, and he thought the right thing to do was to come back and make a home for his daughter. They're living at the moment with his uncle, Sir Roderick Horsfield. Uncle by marriage, that is. Uh, that's only temporary. His wife's looking at houses all over London. Expense, no object. They're rolling in money. Poirot sighed. I know, he said. What you outline to me is a success story. Everyone makes money. Everybody is of good family and highly respected. Their relations are distinguished. They are well thought of in business circles. There is only one cloud in the sky. A girl who is said to be a bit wanting. A girl who is mixed up with a dubious boyfriend who has been on probation more than once. A girl who may quite possibly have tried to poison her stepmother, and who either suffers from hallucinations or else has committed a crime. I tell you, None of that accords well with the success story you have brought me. Mr. Gobi shook his head sadly, and said rather obscurely, There's one in every family? This Mrs. Restaric is quite a young woman. I presume she is not the woman he originally ran away with. Oh, no. That bust up quite soon. She was a pretty bad lot, by all accounts, and a tartar as well. 
He was a fool never to be taken in by her. Mr. Gobi shut his notebook and looked inquiringly at Poirot. Anything more you want me to do? Yes. I want to know a little more about the late Mrs. Andrew Restarek. She was an invalid. She was frequently in nursing homes. What kind of nursing homes? Mental homes? I take your point, Mr. Poirot. And any history of insanity in the family? On either side? I'll see to it, Mr. Poirot. Mr. Gobi rose to his feet. Then I'll take leave of you, sir. Good night. Poirot remained thoughtful after Mr. Gobi had left. He raised and lowered his eyebrows. He wondered. He wondered very much. Then he rang Mrs. Oliver. I told you before, he said, to be careful. I repeat that. Be very careful. Well, careful of what? said Mrs. Oliver. Of yourself. I think there might be danger. Danger to anyone who goes poking about where they are not wanted. There is murder in the air. I do not want it to be yours. Have you had the information you said you might have? Yes, said Poirot. I have had a little information, mostly rumour and gossip, but it seems something happened at Borodin Mansions. What sort of thing? Blood in the courtyard, said Poirot. Really? said Mrs. Oliver. That's just like the title of an old-fashioned detective story. The stain on the staircase. I mean, nowadays, you say something more like, She asked for death. Perhaps there may not have been blood in the courtyard. Perhaps it is only what an imaginative Irish porter imagined. Probably an upset milk bottle, said Mrs. Oliver. He couldn't see it at night. What happened? Poirot did not answer directly. The girl thought she might have committed a murder. Was that the murder she meant? You mean she did shoot someone? One might presume that she did shoot at someone, but for all intents and purposes missed them. A few drops of blood, that was all, no body. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Oliver. It's all very confused. Surely, if anyone could still run out of a courtyard, you wouldn't think you'd killed them, would you? C'est difficile, said Poirot, and rang off. I'm worried, said Claudia Rees Holland. She refilled her cup from the coffee percolator. Francis Carey gave an enormous yawn. Both girls were breakfasting in the small kitchen of the flat. Claudia was dressed and ready to start for her day's work. Frances was still in dressing gown and pyjamas. Her black hair fell over one eye. "'I'm worried about Norma,' continued Claudia. Frances yawned. Oh, "'I shouldn't worry if I were you. She'll ring up or turn up sooner or later, I suppose.' "'Will she? You know, Fran, I can't help wondering.' "'I don't see why,' said Frances, pouring herself out more coffee. She sipped it doubtfully. "'I mean, Norma's not really our business, is she? "'I mean, we're not looking after her or spoon-feeding her or anything. "'She just shares the flat. "'Why all this motherly solicitude? "'I certainly wouldn't worry. "'I dare say you wouldn't. "'You never worry over anything. "'But it's not the same for you as it is for me. "'Why isn't it the same?' You mean because you're the tenant of the flat or something? Well, I'm in rather a special position, as you might say. Francis gave another enormous yawn. Oh, I was up too late last night, she said. At Basil's party. I feel dreadful. Oh, well, I suppose black coffee will be helpful. Have some more before I've drunk it all. Basil would make us try some new pills. Emerald dreams. I don't think it's really worth trying all these silly things. You'll be late at your gallery, said Claudia. Oh, well, I don't suppose it matters much. Nobody notices or cares. I saw David last night, she added. He was all dressed up and really looked rather wonderful. Now, don't say you're falling for him too, Fran. He really is too awful. Oh, I know you think so. You're such a conventional type, Claudia. Not at all. But I cannot say I care for all your arty set, trying out all these drugs and passing out or getting fighting mad. Francis looked amused. I'm not a drug fiend, dear. I just like to see what these things are like. And some of the gang are all right. David can paint, you know, if he wants to. David doesn't very often want to, though, does he? You've always got your knife into him, Claudia. You hate him, coming here to see Norma and talking of knives. Well... Talking of knives? I've been worrying, said Francis slowly, whether to tell you something or not. Claudia glanced at her wristwatch. 
"'I haven't got time now,' she said. "'You can tell me this evening if you want to tell me something. "'Anyway, I'm not in the mood. "'Oh, dear,' she sighed. "'I wish I knew what to do.' "'About Norma?' "'Yes. "'I'm wondering if her parents ought to know that we don't know where she is. "'That would be very unsporting. "'Poor Norma. "'Why shouldn't she slope off on her own if she wants to? "'Well, Norma isn't exactly—' "'Claudia stopped. "'No, she isn't, is she? non compass mentis. "'That's what you meant. "'Have you rung up that terrible place where she works? "'Home birds, or whatever it's called?' "'Oh, yes, of course you did, I remember.' "'So where is she?' demanded Claudia. "'Did David say anything last night?' "'David didn't seem to know. "'Claudia, I can't see that it matters.' "'It matters for me,' said Claudia, "'because my boss happens to be her father. "'Sooner or later, if anything peculiar has happened to her, "'they'll ask me why I didn't mention the fact that she hadn't come home. "'Yes, I suppose they might pitch it on you. "'But there's no real reason, is there, "'why Norma should have to report to us every time "'she's going to be away from here for a day or two.' or even a few nights. I mean, she's not a paying guest or anything. You're not in charge of the girl. No, but Mr. Resteric did mention he felt glad to know that she'd got a room here with us. So that entitles you to go and tittle-tattle about her every time she's absent without leave. She's probably got a crush on some new man. She's got a crush on David, said Claudia. Are you sure she isn't holed up at his place? Oh, I shouldn't think so. He doesn't really care for her, you know. "'You'd like to think he doesn't,' said Claudia. "'You're rather sweet on David yourself.' "'Certainly not,' said Francis sharply. "'Nothing of the kind.' "'David's really keen on her,' said Claudia. "'If not, why did he come round looking for her the other day?' "'You soon marched him out again,' said Francis. "'I think,' she added, getting up and looking at her face in a rather unflattering small kitchen mirror, "'I think it might have been me he really came to see. "'You're too idiotic.' "'He came here looking for Norma.' "'That girl's mental,' said Francis. "'Sometimes I really think she is. "'Well, I know she is. "'Look here, Claudia. "'I'm going to tell you that something now. "'You ought to know. "'I broke the string of my bra the other day, "'and I was in a hurry. "'I know you don't like anyone fiddling with your things. "'I certainly don't,' said Claudia. "'But Norma never minds, or doesn't notice. "'Anyway, I went into her room, "'and I rootled in her drawer, and I... "'Well... "'I found something. A knife. A knife?' said Claudia, surprised. "'What sort of a knife?' Oh, "'You know, we had that sort of shindy thing in the courtyard. "'A group of beats, teenagers, who came in here and were having a fight with flick knives and all that. "'And Norma came in just after. Yes, yes, I remember. "'One of the boys got stabbed, so a reporter told me, and he ran away. "'Well, the knife in Norma's drawer was a flick knife. "'It had got a stain on it.' "'Looked like dried blood. "'Francis! "'You're being absurdly dramatic. "'Perhaps. "'But I'm sure that's what it was. "'And what on earth was that "'doing hidden away in Norma's drawer, "'I should like to know? "'I suppose she might have picked it up. "'What a souvenir! "'And hidden it away and never told us. "'What did you do with it?' "'I put it back,' said Francis slowly. "'I... I didn't know what else to do. I, I couldn't decide whether to tell you or not. Then yesterday I looked again, and it was gone, Claudia. Not a trace of it. You think she sent David here to get it? Well, she might have done. I tell you, Claudia, in future I'm going to keep my door locked at night. Mrs. Oliver woke up dissatisfied. She saw stretching before her a day with nothing to do. Having packed off her completed manuscript with a highly virtuous feeling, work was over. She had now only as many times before to relax, to enjoy herself, to lie fallow until the creative urge became active once more. She walked about her flat in a rather aimless fashion, touching things, picking them up, putting them down, looking in the drawers of her desk— realizing that there were plenty of letters there to be dealt with, but feeling also that in her present state of virtuous accomplishment she was certainly not going to deal with anything so tiresome as that now. She wanted something interesting to do. She wanted... What did she want? She thought about the conversation she had had with Hercule Poirot, the warning he had given her. Ridiculous. After all, why shouldn't she participate in this problem which she was sharing with Poirot? 
Poirot might choose to sit in a chair, put the tips of his fingers together, and set his grey cells whirring to work while his body reclined comfortably within four walls, that was not the procedure that appealed to Ariadne Oliver. She had said, very forcibly, that she at least was going to do something. She was going to find out more about this mysterious girl. Where was Norma Ristaric? What was she doing? What more could she, Ariadne Oliver, find out about her? Mrs. Oliver prowled about, more and more disconsolate. What could one do? It wasn't very easy to decide. Go somewhere and ask questions? Should she go down to Long Basing? But Poirot had already been there and found out, presumably, what there was to be found out. And what excuse could she offer for barging into Sir Roderick Horsfield's house? She considered another visit to Borodine Mansions. Something still to be found out there, perhaps. She would have to think of another excuse for going there. She wasn't quite sure what excuse she would use, but anyway, that seemed the only possible place where more information could be obtained. What was the time? Ten a.m. There were certain possibilities. On the way there, she concocted an excuse. Not a very original excuse. In fact, Mrs. Oliver would have liked to have found something more intriguing, but perhaps, she reflected prudently, it was just as well to keep to something completely everyday and plausible. She arrived at the stately, if grim, elevation of Borodine Mansions, and walked slowly round the courtyard, considering it. A porter was conversing with a furniture van. A milkman, pushing his milk float, came to join Mrs. Oliver near the service lift. He rattled bottles, cheerfully whistling, whilst Mrs. Oliver continued to stare abstractedly at the furniture van. "'Lama 76 moving out?' explained the milkman to Mrs. Oliver, mistaking her interest. He transferred a clutch of bottles from his float to the lift. "'Not that she hasn't moved already, in a manner of speaking,' he added, emerging again. He seemed a cheery kind of milkman. He pointed a thumb upwards. "'Pitched herself out of a window. Seventh floor. Only a week ago it was. Five o'clock in the morning. Funny time to choose.' Mrs. Oliver didn't think it so funny. "'Why? Why did she do it? <laughs> Nobody knows. Balance of mind disturbed,' they said. "'Was she uh, young?' "'Nah, just an old trout.' Fifty if she was a day. Two men struggled in the van with a chest of drawers. It resisted them, and two mahogany drawers crashed to the ground. A loose piece of paper floated towards Mrs. Oliver, who caught it. <laughs> Don't smash everything, Charlie, said the cheerful milkman reprovingly, and went up in the lift with his cargo of bottles. An altercation broke out between the furniture movers. Mrs. Oliver offered them the piece of paper, but they waved it away. Making up her mind, Mrs. Oliver entered the building and went up to number 67. A clank came from inside, and presently the door was opened by a middle-aged woman with a mop who was clearly engaged in household labours. "'Oh,' said Mrs. Oliver, using her favourite monosyllable, "'good morning. Is—I uh, wonder, is anyone in?' "'No, I'm afraid not, madam. They're all out. They've gone to work.' "'Yes, of course. As a matter of fact, when I was here last—' I left a little diary behind. So annoying. It must be in the sitting-room somewhere. Well, I haven't picked up anything of the kind, madam, as far as I know. Of course, I mightn't have known it was yours. Uh, would you like to come in? She opened the door hospitably, set aside the mop with which she had been treating the kitchen floor, and accompanied Mrs. Oliver into the sitting-room. Yes, said Mrs. Oliver, determined to establish friendly relations— Yes, I see here. That's the book I left for Miss Risteric, uh, Miss Norma. Is she back from the country yet? I don't think she's living here at the moment. Her bed wasn't slept in. Uh, perhaps she's still down with her people in the country. I know she was going there last weekend. Yes, I expect that's it, said Mrs. Oliver. This was a book I brought her. One of my books. One of Mrs. Oliver's books did not seem to strike any chord of interest in the cleaning woman. I was sitting here, went on Mrs. Oliver, patting an armchair. At least I think so. And then I moved to the window, and uh, perhaps to the sofa. She dug down vehemently behind the cushions of the chair. The cleaning woman obliged by doing the same thing to the sofa cushions. You've no idea how maddening it is when one loses something like that, went on Mrs. Oliver chattily. One has all one's engagements written down there. I'm quite sure I'm lunching with someone very important today, and I can't remember who it was or where the luncheon was to be. Only, of course, it may be tomorrow. If so... I'm lunching with someone else quite different. Oh, dear. Very trying for you, ma'am, I'm sure, said the cleaning woman with sympathy. They're such nice flats, these, said Mrs. Oliver, looking round. A long way up. Well, that gives you a very good view, doesn't it? 
Yes, but if they face east, you get a lot of cold wind in winter. Comes right through these metal window frames. Some people have had double windows put in. Oh, yes. I wouldn't care for a flat face in this way in winter. No. Give me a nice ground floor flat every time. Much more convenient, too, if you've got children for prams and all that, you know. Oh, yes. I'm all for the ground floor, I am. Think if there was to be a fire. Yes, of course, that would be terrible, said Mrs. Oliver. I suppose there are fire escapes. Well, you can't always get to a fire door. Terrified of fire, I am. Always have been. They're ever so expensive, these flats. You wouldn't believe the rents they ask. That's why Miss Holland, she gets two other girls to go in with her. Oh, yes. I think I met them both. Uh, Miss Kerr is an artist, isn't she? Works for an art gallery, she does. Don't work at it very hard, though. She paints a bit. Cows and trees that you'd never recognise as being what they're meant to be. An untidy young lady. The state her room is in, you wouldn't believe it. Now, Miss Holland, everything is always as neat as a new pin. She was a secretary in the coal board at one time, but she's a private secretary in the city now. She likes it better, she says. She's secretary to a very rich gentleman just come back from South America or somewhere like that. He's Miss Norma's father, and it was he who asked Miss Holland to take her as a boarder when the last young lady went off to get married, and she mentioned as she was looking for another girl. Well, she couldn't very well refuse, could she? Not since he was her employer. Did she want to refuse? The woman sniffed. I think she would have, if she'd known. Known what? The question was too direct. Oh, it's not for me to say anything, I'm sure. It's not my business. Mrs. Oliver continued to look mildly inquiring. Mrs. Mopp fell. It's not that she isn't a nice young lady. Scatty, but then they're nearly all scatty. But I think it's a doctor ought to see her. There are times when she doesn't seem to know rightly what she's doing or where she is. It gives you quite a turn sometimes. Looks just how my husband's nephew does after he's had a fit. Terrible fits he has. You wouldn't believe. Only I've never known her have fits. Maybe she takes things. A lot do. I believe uh, there is a young man her family doesn't approve of. Yes, so I've heard. He's come here to call for her once or twice, though I've never seen him. One of these mods, by all accounts. Miss Ollen doesn't like it. But what can you do nowadays? Girls go their own way. Sometimes one feels very upset about girls nowadays, said Mrs. Oliver, and tried to look serious and responsible. Not brought up right, that's what I says. I'm afraid not. No, I'm afraid not. One feels really a girl like Norma Resteric would be better at home than coming all alone to London and earning her living as an interior decorator. She don't like it at home. Really? Got a stepmother. Girls don't like stepmothers. From what I've heard, the stepmother's done her best, tried to pull her up, tried to keep flashy young men out of the house, that sort of thing. She knows girls pick up with the wrong young man, and a lot of harm may come of it. Sometimes, the cleaning woman spoke impressively, I'm thankful I've never had any daughters. Have you got sons? Two boys we've got. One's doing very well at school, and the other one, he's in a printer's, doing well there, too. Yes, very nice boys they are. Mind you, boys can cause you trouble, too, but girls is more worrying, I think. You feel you ought to be able to do something about them. Yes, said Mrs. Oliver thoughtfully. One does feel that. She saw signs of the cleaning woman wishing to return to her cleaning. It's too bad about my diary, she said. Well, thank you very much, and I hope I haven't wasted your time. Well, I hope you'll find it, I'm sure, said the other woman obligingly. Mrs. Oliver went out of the flat and considered what she should do next. She couldn't think of anything she could do further that day but a plan for tomorrow began to form in her mind. When she got home, Mrs. Oliver, in an important way, got out a notebook and jotted down in it various things under the heading, Facts I Have Learned. On the whole, the facts did not amount to very much, but Mrs. Oliver, true to her calling, managed to make the most of them that could be made. Possibly the fact that Claudia Rees Holland was employed by Norma's father was the most salient fact of any. She had not known that before. She rather doubted if Hercule Poirot had known it either. She thought of ringing him up on the telephone and acquainting him with it, but decided to keep it to herself for the moment because of her plan for the morrow. In fact, Mrs. Oliver felt at this moment less like a detective novelist than like an ardent bloodhound. She was on the trail, nose down on the scent, and tomorrow morning, well, tomorrow morning we would see. True to her plan, Mrs. Oliver rose early partook of two cups of tea and a boiled egg, and started out on her quest. 
Once more she arrived in the vicinity of Borodin Mansions. She wondered whether she might be getting a bit well known there, so this time she did not enter the courtyard, but skulked around either one entrance to it or the other, scanning the various people who were turning out into the morning drizzle to trot off on their way to work. They were mostly girls, and looked deceptively alike. How extraordinary human beings were when you considered them like this, emerging purposefully from those large, tall buildings, just like anthills, thought Mrs. Oliver. One had never considered an anthill properly, she decided. It always looked so aimless, as one disturbed it with the toe of a shoe. All those little things rushing about with bits of grass in their mouths, streaming along industriously, worried, anxious, looking as though they were running to and fro, going nowhere— but presumably they were just as well organized as these human beings here. That man, for instance, who had just passed her, scurrying along, muttering to himself, "'I wonder what's upsetting you,' thought Mrs. Oliver. She walked up and down a little more. Then she drew back suddenly. Claudia Rees Holland came out of the entranceway, walking at a brisk, business-like pace. As before, she looked very well turned out. Mrs. Oliver turned away, so that she would not be recognized— once she had allowed Claudia to get a sufficient distance ahead of her, she wheeled round again and followed in her tracks. Claudia Rees Holland came to the end of the street and turned right into a main thoroughfare. She came to a bus stop and joined the queue. Mrs. Oliver, still following her, felt a momentary uneasiness. Supposing Claudia should turn round, look at her, recognize her. All Mrs. Oliver could think of was to do several protracted but noiseless blows of the nose— but Claudia Rees Holland seemed totally absorbed in her own thoughts. She looked at none of her fellow waiters for buses. Mrs. Oliver was about third in the queue behind her. Finally, the right bus came, and there was a surge forward. Claudia got on the bus and went straight up to the top. Mrs. Oliver got inside and was able to get a seat close to the door as the uncomfortable third person. When the conductor came round for fares, Mrs. Oliver pressed a reckless one and sixpence into his hand. After all, she had no idea by what route the bus went, or indeed how far the distance was, to what the cleaning woman had described vaguely as one of those new buildings by St. Paul's. She was on the alert and ready when the venerable dome was at last sighted. Any time now, she thought to herself, and fixed a steady eye on those who descended from the platform above. Ah, yes, there came Claudia, neat and chic in her smart suit. She got off the bus— Mrs. Oliver followed her, in due course, and kept at a nicely calculated distance. "'Very interesting,' thought Mrs. Oliver. "'Here I am, actually trailing someone, just like in my books. And what's more, I must be doing it very well, because she hasn't the least idea.' Claudia Rees Holland, indeed, looked very much absorbed in her own thoughts. "'That's a very capable-looking girl,' thought Mrs. Oliver, as indeed she had thought before. If I was thinking of having a go at guessing a murderer, a good, capable murderer, I'd choose someone very like her. Unfortunately, nobody had been murdered yet. That is to say, unless the girl Norma had been entirely right in her assumption that she herself had committed a murder. This part of London seemed to have suffered, or profited, from a large amount of building in the recent years. Enormous skyscrapers, most of which Mrs. Oliver thought very hideous, mounted to the sky with a square, matchbox-like air. Claudia turned into a building. Now I shall find out exactly, thought Mrs. Oliver, and turned into it after her. Four lifts appeared to be going all up and down with frantic haste. This, Mrs. Oliver thought, was going to be more difficult. However, they were of a very large size, and by getting into Claudia's one at the last minute— Mrs. Oliver was able to interpose large masses of tall men between herself and the figure she was following. Claudia's destination turned out to be the fourth floor. She went along a corridor, and Mrs. Oliver, lingering behind two of her tall men, noted the door where she went in. Three doors from the end of the corridor. Mrs. Oliver arrived at the same door in due course, and was able to read the legend on it. Joshua Ristaric Limited was the legend it bore. Having got as far as that, Mrs. Oliver felt as though she did not quite know what to do next. She had found Norma's father's place of business, and the place where Claudia worked, but now, slightly disabused, she felt that this was not as much of a discovery as it might have been. Frankly, did it help? Probably it didn't. 
She waited around a few moments, walking from one end to the other of the corridor, looking to see if anybody else interesting went in at the door of Ristaric Enterprises. Two or three girls did, but they did not look particularly interesting. Mrs. Oliver went down again in the lift and walked rather disconsolately out of the building. She couldn't quite think what to do next. She took a walk round the adjacent streets. She meditated a visit to St. Paul's. I might go up in the whispering gallery and whisper, thought Mrs. Oliver. I wonder now how the whispering gallery would do for the scene of a murder. No, she decided. Too profane, I'm afraid. No, I don't think that would be quite nice. She walked thoughtfully towards the mermaid theatre. That, she thought, had far more possibilities. She walked back in the direction of the various new buildings. Then, feeling the lack of a more substantial breakfast than she had had, she turned into a local café. It was moderately well filled with people having extra late breakfast or else early elevenses. Mrs. Oliver, looking round vaguely for a suitable table, gave a gasp. At a table near the wall, the girl Norma was sitting, and opposite her was sitting a young man with lavish chestnut hair curled on his shoulders, wearing a red velvet waistcoat and a very fancy jacket. David, said Mrs. Oliver, under her breath, it must be David. He and the girl Norma were talking excitedly together. Mrs. Oliver considered a plan of campaign, made up her mind, and nodding her head in satisfaction, crossed the floor of the café to a discreet door marked Ladies. Mrs. Oliver was not quite sure whether Norma was likely to recognize her or not. It was not always the vaguest-looking people who proved vaguest in fact. At the moment, Norma did not look as though she was very likely to look at anybody but David, but who knows? I expect I can do something to myself anyway, thought Mrs. Oliver. She looked at herself in a small, fly-blown mirror provided by the café's management, studying particularly what she considered to be the focal point of a woman's appearance, her hair. No one knew this better than Mrs. Oliver, owing to the innumerable times that she had changed her mode of hairdressing and had failed to be recognized by her friends in consequence. Giving her head an appraising eye, she started work. Out came the pins. She took off several coils of hair, wrapped them up in her handkerchief, and stuffed them into her handbag, parted her hair in the middle, combed it sternly back from her face, and rolled it up into a modest bun at the back of her neck. She also took out a pair of spectacles and put them on her nose. There was a really earnest look about her now, almost intellectual, Mrs. Oliver thought approvingly. She altered the shape of her mouth by an application of lipstick, and emerged once more into the café, moving carefully, since the spectacles were only for reading, and in consequence the landscape was blurred. She crossed the café, and made her way to an empty table, next to that occupied by Norma and David. She sat down so that she was facing David. Norma, on the near side, sat with her back to her. Norma, therefore, would not see her, unless she turned her head right round. The waitress drifted up. Mrs. Oliver ordered a cup of coffee and a bath bun, and settled down to be inconspicuous. Norma and David did not even notice her. They were deeply in the middle of a passionate discussion. It took Mrs. Oliver just a minute or two to tune into them. "'But you only fancy these things,' David was saying. "'You imagine them. They're all utter, utter nonsense, my dear girl.' "'I don't know. I, I can't tell.' Norma's voice had a queer lack of resonance in it. Mrs. Oliver could not hear her as well as she heard David, since Norma's back was turned to her, but the dullness of the girl's tone struck her disagreeably. There was something wrong here, she thought, very wrong. She remembered the story as Poirot had first told it to her. She thinks she may have committed a murder. What was the matter with the girl? Hallucinations? Was her mind really slightly affected, or was it no more and no less than truth, and in consequence the girl had suffered a bad shock? If you ask me, it's all fuss on Mary's part. She's a thoroughly stupid woman anyway, and she imagines she has illnesses and all that sort of thing. She was ill. All right, then, she was ill. Any sensible woman would get the doctor to give her some antibiotic or other, and not to get het up. She thought I did it to her. My father thinks so, too. I tell you, Norma, you're imagining all these things. You just say that to me, David. You say it to me to cheer me up. Supposing I did give her the stuff. What do you mean? 
Suppose. You must know whether you did or you didn't. You can't be so idiotic, Norma. I don't know. You keep saying that. You keep coming back to that and saying it again and again. I don't know. I don't know. You don't understand. You don't understand in the least what hate is. I hated her from the first moment I saw her. I know. You told me that. But well, that's the queer part of it. I told you that. And yet I don't even remember telling you that. Do you see? Every now and then I... I tell people things. I tell people things that I want to do or that I have done or that I am going to do. But I don't even remember telling them the things. It's as though I was thinking all those things in my mind and sometimes they come out in the open and I say them to people. I did say them to you, didn't I? Well, I mean, look here, don't let's harp back to that. But I did say it to you, didn't I? All right, all right, one says things like that. I hate her and I like to kill her. I think I'll poison her. But that's only kid stuff, if you know what I mean. As though you weren't quite grown up. It's a very natural thing. Children say it a lot. I hate so-and-so. I'll cut his head off. Kids say it at school. About some master they particularly dislike. You think it was just that? But that sounds as though I wasn't grown up. Well, you're not in some ways. If you just pull yourself together, realize how silly it all is, what can it matter if you do hate her? You've got away from home, and you don't have to live with her. Why shouldn't I live in my own home, with my own father? said Norma. It's not fair. It's not fair. First he went away and left my mother, and now, just when he's coming back to me, he goes and marries Mary. Of course I hate her, and she hates me too. I used to think about killing her, I used to think of ways of doing it, I used to enjoy thinking like that, but then, when she really got ill, David said uneasily, You don't think you're a witch or anything, do you? You don't make figures in wax and stick pins into them, or do that sort of thing? Oh, no, that would be silly. What I did was real, quite real. Look here, Norma, what do you mean when you say it was real? The bottle was there in my drawer. Yes. I opened the drawer and found it. What bottle? The Dragon Exterminator. Selective Weed Killer, that's what it was labelled. Stuff in a dark green bottle. You were supposed to spray it on things. It had labels with caution and poison, too. Did you buy it? Or did you just find it? I don't know where I got it. But it was there, in my drawer, and it was half empty. And then you... you remembered? Yes said Norma. Yes. Her voice was vague, almost dreamy. Yes. I think it was then it all came back to me. You think so too, don't you, David? I don't know what to make of you, Norma. I really don't. I think in a way you're making it all up. You're telling it to yourself. But she went to hospital for observation. They said they were puzzled. They said they couldn't find anything wrong. So she came home. And then she got ill again, and I began to be frightened. My father began looking at me in a queer sort of way, and then the doctor came, and they talked together, shut up in father's study. I went round outside and crept up to the window, and I tried to listen. I wanted to hear what they were saying. They were planning together to send me away to a place where I'd be shut up, a place where I'd have a course of treatment or something. They thought, you see, that I was crazy, and I was frightened because, because I wasn't sure what I'd done or what I hadn't done. Is that when you ran away? No, that was later. Tell me. I don't want to talk about it any more. You'll have to let them know sooner or later where you are. I won't. I hate them. I hate my father as much as I hate Mary. I wish they were dead. I wish they were both dead. Then, then I think I'd be happy again. Look, don't get all het up. Look here, Norma. He paused in an embarrassed manner. I'm not very set on marriage and all that rubbish. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever do anything of that kind. Well, not for years. One doesn't want to tie oneself up. But I think it's the best thing we could do. You know? Get married. At a registry office or something. You'll have to say you're over twenty-one, roll up your hair, put on some spectacles or something. Make you look a bit older. Once we're married, your father can't do a thing. 
He can't send you away to what you call a place. He'll be powerless. I hate him. You seem to hate everybody. Only my father and Mary. Well, after all, it's quite natural for a man to marry again. Look what he did to my mother. All that must have been a long time ago. Yes, I was only a child, but I remember. He went away and left us. He sent me presents at Christmas, but he never came himself. I wouldn't even have known him if I'd met him in the street by the time he did come back. He didn't mean anything to me by then. I think he got my mother shut up, too. She used to go away when she was ill. I don't know where. I don't know what was the matter with her. Sometimes I wonder. I wonder, David. I think, you know, there, there's something wrong in my head, and some day it will make me do something really bad. Like the knife. What knife? It doesn't matter. Just a knife. Well, can't you tell me what you're talking about? I think it had blood stains on it. It was hidden there. Under my stockings. Do you remember hiding a knife there? I think so. But I can't remember what I'd done with it before that. I, I can't remember where I'd been. There was a whole hour gone out of that evening, a whole hour I didn't know where I'd been. I'd been somewhere and done something. Hush. He whispered it quickly as the waitress approached their table. You'll be all right. I'll look after you. Uh, let's have something more, he said to the waitress in a loud voice, picking up the menu. Uh, two baked beans on toast. Hercule Poirot was dictating to his secretary, Miss Lemon. And while I much appreciate the honour you have done me, I must regretfully inform you that the telephone rang. Miss Lemon stretched out a hand for it. Yes? Who did you say? She put her hand over the receiver and said to Poirot, Mrs. Oliver. Ah, Mrs. Oliver, said Poirot. He did not particularly want to be interrupted at this moment, but he took the receiver from Miss Lemon. Allô, he said. Hercule Poirot speaks. Oh, Monsieur Poirot, I'm so glad I got you. I found her for you. I beg your pardon? I found her for you, your girl. You know, the one who's committed a murder, or thinks she has. She's talking about it, too, a great deal. I think she's off her head, but never mind that now. Do you want to come and get her? Where are you, chère madame? Somewhere between St. Paul's and the Mermaid Theatre and all that. Calthorpe Street, said Mrs. Oliver, suddenly looking out of the telephone box in which she was standing. Do you think you can get here quickly? They're in a restaurant. They? Oh, uh, she and what I suppose is the unsuitable boyfriend. He is rather nice, really, and he seems very fond of her. I can't think why. People are odd. Well, I don't want to talk, because I want to get back again. I've followed them, you see. I came into the restaurant and saw them there. Aha! You have been very clever, madame. Oh, no, I haven't really. It was pure accident. I mean, I walked into a small cafe place, and there the girl was, just sitting there. Ah, you had the good fortune, then. That is just as important. And I've been sitting at the table next to them, only she's got her back to me. And anyway, I don't suppose she'd recognize me. I've done things to my hair. Anyway, they've been talking as though they were alone in the world. And when they ordered another course, baked beans, I can't bear baked beans. It always seems to me so funny that people should. Never mind the baked beans. Go on. You left them and came out to telephone. Is that right? Yes, because the baked beans gave me time. And I shall go back now, or I might hang about outside. Anyway, try and get here quickly. What is the name of this café? The Merry Shamrock, but it doesn't look very merry. In fact, it looks rather sordid, but the coffee is quite good. Say no more. Go back. In due course, I will arrive. Splendid, said Mrs. Oliver, and rang off.